to save time i'm going to invite our panelists while they're setting up the stage sandeep batra uh, from pedilite nand kumar tirumalai from tata chemicals and vimal agarwal cfo mahindra life spaces please join me on stage our next session is titled cracking the decision paradox how cfos can transform decision dilemmas into growth um we've spent a lot of time this morning talking about the kind of challenges the kind of uncertainty um i think the there's no doubt left in literally the first one and a half hours of this day that the biggest problem that each one of us faces every single day is really just not knowing enough now the fact that we all grew up with believing that excel sheets could be used to run the world you put in a number and you get something out this desire to bring certainty into everything the ability to do a cost benefit analysis the ability to do a really smart pros and cons swot analysis of things i think each one of us realizes that some of our, it is good discipline but the outcome of it is really not something that you can take for granted you have your plan b and plan c and i think plan z this morning somebody i think you all want here when somebody said you know the world economic forum has run this big risk survey but it didn't mention any potential collapse of a bank or a financial institution anywhere in the world and the kind of ripple effects that it could cause so in that context given that the cfo carries the mandate for a lot of the governance a lot of the prudence that you need to bring into organizations i mean you're being asked to be innovative you're being asked to take risks you're being asked to be nimble i mean the word that i heard all through the morning was given the uncertainty and the unpredictability of the environment what you really need to be is nimble so in that context how do you crunch decision making uh into short period of time while making sure that you're not making exposing yourself and your organization to the kind of scrutiny to the expectations from regulators all of those things that are about being prudent and being careful um as we uh, as we run our organizations and our businesses so i think what i want to start with is very quickly before we do that can you all please join me in welcoming our panelists Th thank you very much for being here i want to start with each one of you giving me a very quick like a two line response to how does this look for you what does the day to day dilemma this thing that we are saying the decision paradox what does it look like every day for you what are the kind of decisions that give you the most like sweat or uh, panic attacks in terms of the taking a wrong step or taking the wrong decision there could actually be quite uh, disastrous and what is it that makes you flip so talk just opening remarks and then we'll come to questions i was reflecting on the topic and what one is supposed to speak so i think the the guard rails are very clear they may vary from company to company but i think when confronted with decisions the first and foremost is uh, reputation of the organization in whatever decision you are subscribing to because reputation is linked to governance linked to what outcome of that decision is uh, somebody um, very early on in my career told me that uh you know you, there is something called a smell test so you know how does how does that decision look if tomorrow it were to come out in the papers so that's the first uh, threshold and then of course uh, we can talk about the other things but the first thing i do is look at does it smell right and tomorrow if it were to be in the papers very nice i'm going to go to the others and i'm going to ask a follow on question thank you anuradha and go, go, morning to all so i think in terms of what sandeep mentioned is right in terms of that's the most important test that what what does that mean in terms of the long term and what does it mean in terms of the perception of what call we take here i think we are on stage every day in terms of taking a call in terms of every minute every every hour something being taken call in terms of long term short term so i think uh, in our specific case of tata chemicals where i work in the the biggest issue we have is the input cost 
energy cost. Therefore, the way it's moving, therefore, a lot of decisions are taken based upon the movement of this kind of cost and therefore, how do we hedge? Not hedge is more operational, but those things happen throughout the day or throughout the month. I think the most important is to ensure that there are enough guardrails presented there and that there is nothing wrong with what we take and that whatever calls you take has got a long-term value for the company. Okay. I mean, um, I'm going to come back to the question. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so, coming back to the point, Anuradha, which you said as to how does a day look like, quite frankly for me, uh, you know, one filter which very early on in my career someone said this, I'm just repeating it. Uh, the question was that what hat should you wear? And the response was coming from the fact that do you want to be a controller, a planner or a business partner? And over the years I have thought about it. The response which I have been able to tell myself every day is that it's the one hat which you wear. The shades keeps on wearing every day. What it means is that if you are a financial controller, uh, there are certain aspects, certain decisions which are go or no go. Uh, that you can't compromise. If something to do with governance and ethics, you know, it's no-go and simple decision, be done with it. If you are acting as a planner, it has to make sense, make sense, maybe less from PNL point of view, but much more from balance sheet point of view. And if you're partnering with business, then obviously you need to assess the risk and then keep deciding uh, whether the risk, will the organization be able to stand up that risk if that risk was really materialized. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think everything that all three of you have said is really, I mean, it feels like, it seems very, it seems the way we all work, right? Or at least most of us would like to. Give, explain it to us with an example. In each of your cases, take an example, either you can do that or what would be even more fun is pick an example that you have read in the press about some other company. You know, it could be somebody you know, it could be a, it could be just an observation that I would never do that or you know what, I would have done that too and these guys have really got the wrong end of the stick. I don't read much, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I will give uh, an example from my uh, own company. I think, um, you know, the way I at least uh, uh, look at it is that CFOs do a very good job when it comes to dealing with a crisis, right? Um, let's say when the pandemic happened, the CFO took the hat of conserving cost and uh, cash. So what to cut is very simple. You can say no to many things. Actually, Sandeep, it's a great example. So I'm going to ask you what I want to get at. Hmm? Let's take the pandemic. So all of you started with saying reputation. How do you know what reputation is wants to be chased at that point. So during the pandemic, the reputation could have been of the survivor or it could have been of the kind company. You had both those options in most places. My tiny organizations, we had decided that, you know, the budget allowed us to cover those expenses, but I could have been a really smart finance person and buff, uh, buffered up my reserves by laying off everybody that we didn't need. Right? We run a hostel, we run offices, we could have given up that space, we could have let lots of people go. The reputation, the choice of reputation, both of them, those are good reputations. You know, really smart, buffered up, bought runway for the, for the future or that organization with a heart that said, I'm not going to let, what would you do? What, what guides that? Because both are quite, uh, quite understandable reputational objectives. Do you all agree or... Would that be a dilemma? How would you take that call? Anyone? I mean, everybody had that option. Yeah, go ahead. We, I'm from Clovia. We're a startup. And uh, I remember March 24th, uh, bank balance was 80 lakhs. I quote this number a lot of times because that number still rings uh, every night in my in my hmm. mind. And it was, uh, and my monthly bill, I'm, we're a small company. My monthly salary bill was uh, around 2 crores. So, and uh, nobody paid and they were six days away, no orders could go, warehouses were shut. So we took a call, we spoke to all the employees on a Zoom call. I think a lot of a lot of companies did that. And we said, see, life is tough. Huh? We we start from here, this is ground zero. Isse nahi ho sakta, isse aage badte and for the next six months, we paid the employees whatever we could maximum. And after everything else is sorted, of course, we also stopped vendor payments, etc. But we had to pay them. They also have their salaries to do. And uh, 
but by the end of september when we did get a feedback and we did all all sorts of stuff to 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 get back to normalcy because business was not normal so we found different businesses like we started manufacturing pp kits and we supplied to almost all states almost all csr uh, committees but uh, at the end of september we released a bonus which is more than their uh, uh, april to september salaries so nice. you know so so, so that that you do something and you get your reputation also yeah, so. because i mean you know sandeep every day today the guys with the maximum money and the maximum reserves on this planet are firing 5000 10000 12000 2000 people every day i mean every quarter or whatever right what do they care about and the truth is the market rewards them every young person who is looking who is great talent wants to be in those companies right on campuses you go those four companies that are firing people left right and center are still the most sought after employers so how are we thinking about this i'm going to throw it back to you now so i think um, first of all i think when the pandemic started at that time obviously everybody's reaction and response was survival how do you cut cost how do you conserve cash but i don't think anybody at that time and we saw that it will last for 2 years everybody thought do it in mahine mein khatam ho jayegi it's a very short term issue so the responses were very short term 3 uh, months let me I, i don't think at that time had somebody told us that you have to plan for a 2 year disruption maybe the responses would have been different but at the same time you know every organization ethos may be different uh some may have a more patriarchal approach some may be cut and dried of the examples that you spoke about our company took a pidlight took a very patriarchal approach and they said look at the junior most level why create stress and uncertainty and the pain was shared depending upon the ability of the person to bear it so senior people took 20 25% cut in uh, salaries which got restored whenever normal c return so i think and i and i think that goodwill you know what goodwill happens outside is separate you can earn brownie points or negative points in the press but you know uh, when i speak to my team and i speak to them in small groups and i have the standard question to ask them what makes you glad what makes you sad mm-hmm. and i will tell you of the people that i would have spoken to in the last 9 months 90% have said what makes us glad is that this is a good. caring organization so if if you've been able to get the goodwill and equity of your team whether they leave you or not is a separate issue but they will become great ambassadors, ambassadors. of your company How and that is people, invaluable you know we promised honest conversations this morning how many people agree with what sandeep saying how many of you believe that your organization would take the kind um caring uh, reputation over and above um financial health or financial benefit okay that's fantastic can i ask this question that 10 years ago in your lives how many people believe that that would have been the same response fascinating no it's fascinating i mean i'm seeing from here it's i think maybe 15% to 75 or 80% yeah. it's just so um, i mean it's so overwhelming at a human level to see where corporations are willing to go today and i think the pandemic has uh, you know made a difference to each one of us as individuals but i think it's really shown something to organizations okay that's great that's great okay I think also adding to Sandeep uh, in Titan, I was there in the pandemic time, not in chemicals. Uh, I think twenty uh, fourth March. Sorry, where were you at that time? Titan. Titan, Titan right? Tata Group, right, yeah. right, right, right. In Bangalore, and mm. uh, we had twenty fourth March the shutdown happening, and sixth uh, of May it reopened, and all those stores across the country were opening up in phases. And the first call taken was that when stores can be opened up and they can be facing the COVID pandemic, why can't the offices centrally be opened up? So sixth of May, all thousand employees came back to work in the corporate office. showing that we are with you in the front line that made the front line much more appreciative of what is happening as a as a group ethos what we having over there number 2 was we have a lot of carigars in uh, in jewelry you know all the support systems people who come and work 
in Tamil Nadu coming from West Bengal, Orissa, they do very good jewelry work and supporting them for uh, entire six, eight months time by giving advances, by giving assistance was done throughout the time. That point in time, the dynamo came was, let's say, the business would say, can I fund him at 0% interest? First cap, I would say, why zero? Why can't I charge equal to my cost of capital? But then over a point, you learn that actually it makes sense to you know fund them at practically zero or even give free money for some time. It happened. So, so our thinking changed. Uh, my thinking changed during the pandemic, how one can be much more caring beyond what you think as a financial controller or a CFO. That's what you happened. You know, all of you come from organizations that have cash or are at least, you know, well-established large corporates. One of the, the CFO business, our consulting business, but most importantly, the foundation that I run, we are, we are not rich. And uh, the team talks about how our organization, we talk about frugal kindness, frugal generosity, frugal scaling, because within that frugality, you can be kind, within that frugality, you can be generous. And I think that's really the point, you know, in the last thing, there was this uh, question around resources. Very few people said that resources were a problem because I think it can be drawn from the ethos and you can figure out ways that in which you want to be uh, despite that. I'm going to come for counterpoints from the audience, but Bimal, give, tell us how you think about this yeah, and, so you know, which uh, part of your reputation. So quite frankly, when this discussion was going on last five minutes, what was playing in my mind was uh, Durga Shankar sir sitting in a boardroom and I doing a presentation for next year plan. This is March 20. Okay, and suddenly, you know, there were a lot of on and off people were going out because they were getting confirmed almost daily, every five minute update that there is something bad which is coming, which was COVID. And our plan was simple, you know, we'll grow 20%, we'll conserve cash, we'll progress, this is the best time. And I'm in real estate infrastructure sector. Okay, and suddenly, our, actually the presentation was stopped, offices were shut and therefore sort of business unusual for us. Uh, over the next 10 days, everyone asked, was asked to sort of, you know, keep the bank lines open, conserve cash, ensure that you have enough money to survive over the next 6 to 12 months. Okay, and that's what we did for next two weeks. Uh, our share price or say share price to book value dropped to less than one. Uh, our sales dropped closer to zero because no one was buying houses. And we were like sitting at home, assuming and thinking what is to be done. Uh, that was the time. You know, you started looking at some more data, which tells you that your script is, your market cap is 1,000 crore, which was about 2,500 crore one month back. So it's struggling on investor front. Your cash availability is there, but there is no sales. So don't know what is to be done with that cash. Uh, but the macro data in terms of affordability, availability of money with the people, if you just look at pure data, last seven years trend was telling us that uh, affordability is at all time high. People are expected to go back and start investing in real estate. And that was the time we went back and started, took a contrarian view as an organization. And I'm taking some credit from finance point of view to enable that data uh, driven decision making. And we went back and started acquiring a lot of assets, either at various levels of development. Today, if I look back, our market cap is about 6x from that uh, uh, lowest. Uh, our sales are about three times versus what it was. Uh, employees base, we never asked anyone to leave. It's about 1.5x from there. And therefore, a lot to learn as to how do you really convert that adversity into a huge opportunity in the years to come. Very nice. Very nice. Can I get some reactions from the audience that are a little bit contrarian? Where your heart said you wanted to do something, whether it was the pandemic or it could be other times, but you had to do something for the business because really you couldn't have been kind in the long term if you didn't do something tough in the short term to save the business. Any examples? Yeah, go ahead. I think uh, I, will, I will use the same example. So during pandemic, uh, we are into a diamond mining company. Uh, and uh, uh, so the first decision, because diamonds are good to have and particularly in a pandemic wherein people are moving towards essential, so there is no need, right? So the first call and then in general, I think our organization is very employee friendly organization. We have not heard in last so many decades we have removed people. But the first time we took that call that we will reduce 30% of, of, of our staff because um, it's, it's the way you are saying it's two, three months. We anticipated it will take a couple of years to come back to the normalcy in our business because it's high end luxury. Uh, and, and hence we took that call and not only us, all other diamond mining companies took very similar call. Now, what really happened is 
post that people started saving more money they were at home there are, there is no expenditure on hospitality in countries like us they have distributed money and suddenly there was excess money and the prices started shooting up for gold and diamond and that was the best year for us in last two decades so i think we have made huge profits um, and and now if you come back and see that the way you are saying i think it's 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 completely a, a wrong decision right so because there was a limited inventory because the mining has cut down and and suddenly prices started going up so even with the lesser inventory you made more money so so i think sometimes this 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 is exactly contrary to what what we are saying but uh, but i think uh, i think it's it's real yeah it's it's real so it's real this is a global decision so and and across the globe we we cut uh, and not only us all diamond mining companies actually cut their their um, workforce almost to the one third yeah anybody else yeah go ahead um a little bit contrary to <clears throat> what everybody said yes gloom uh, gloom and doom most of the time and um in actually pandemic situation i'm my name is vinay i'm from dell technologies um from so, dell yeah from dell um one thing what happened um, after just after pandemic or during pandemic is everybody bought laptops right so mm. hybrid and then connected and work from home and things like that after a brief that march april that everybody talked about we saw a boom a, a big boom in in uh, um, laptop industry right because everybody wanted um, i mean gen- uh, generally most of the workforce has not given laptops but j- uh, suddenly when you are at home and started to work from home we saw a huge surge in demand but what makes companies successful is basically thinking ahead of the curve right i mean some companies did look at different supply chains right because what pandemic taught us was not put all your eggs in the same basket right so kind of making sure your um, diversify your supply chain so that means if one part of the world is struggling if you diversify you are here to play and make the most of it right but at the same time what also companies like um, i mean uh, i mean you have you said you were in bangalore during during that time right i'm from bangalore as well um one uh, thing which happened at least um in that city was the bed shortages right hospital shortages and bed shortages during covid it hit the city big time right and there were patients uh, not getting bed and things like that so one thing what com- our company did was we had task force within our our companies itself our first immediate job was making sure that any employer or our employees extended families get a get a hospital bed and we were uh, using up all our networks uh, inside bangalore and um, um, and outside of our city as well to get them uh, 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 the next uh, i mean i mean the next available bed um, hospital bed as such so it's like it's a mixer of both yeah. how do you enjoy your success because um, uh, because you you see surge in demand or also take care of your employees treat them or treat them as your Um, but i'm i'm going to play devil's advocate because one of the answers could be that if you're seeing a surge in demand and given the environment there could be an argument that the prices of those laptops could have been brought down humongously to make it easier for people i think i mean there's a very interesting example from one of my other hats which is this trifecta consulting work that we do and i was recently uh, recently reading this very interesting example by novartis that they are absolutely steadfast on not making any compromises on their patents and some of their drugs that are high priced but high impact however for the same drug they do what they call pharmaceutical philanthropy where they will take that drug and give it free of cost to huge numbers of people for that goodwill but that goodwill doesn't interfere with their business prospects or the health of the business at one level so i think there's a whole range of organization in the way that they will um that they will um, that they will respond to things like this any other contrarian view or whatever but because what i want to move on to asking is what in your mandate results in sort of a decision paralysis sometimes you know i mean i this is my big grouse against my mother that she brought me up saying you know the smell test by the way my mum's lesson to me as a 7 8 year old was that 
if you ever have uh, a doubt in your head think about this being in the newspaper tomorrow morning and will you be okay um and it's exactly the the smell test but as i've grown older sandeep i've realized that she taught me to choose between right and wrong but life is about sometimes the bigger wrong and the smaller wrong the bigger right and the smaller right it's very seldom between the right and the wrong because then the choices are obvious so um with that framework what are the as a cfo what are for you the things that become like the log jam in decision making and what can you tell everybody else to sort of avoid or the things that come in the way that there are there is a way to overcome that to not that land up in a decision paralysis sure i think it's a very important very relevant uh, dilemma and uh, you know it is something that experience teaches you uh, when you uh, become a finance professional you are taught that you are like the uh, the person who's guarding protecting uh, the accounts the reputation and kind of expectation is much bigger than uh, what you what you actually end up delivering and we are told that you know you are the guard rail you have to prevent wrong from happening and by nature people who become finance professionals are risk averse at least i am risk averse uh, i don't want to generalize and look for perfection look for accuracy that is how the dna is trained and then you realize once you start working that there is nothing called uh, perfection there is no perfect uh, data you know if if a spreadsheet could take the decision then why are you there for right so at least the way i have internalized for myself is that there is data there is some analysis that you can do with that data but most important are you able to distill actionable insights from uh, that analysis and those both words are important you can get hundreds of insights from data but what the hell are you going to do with that insight you have to make it relevant to your organization or the decision that is being uh, uh, under consideration so both insight is important but that insight has to be actionable otherwise it is useless and second thing is that progressively given that the world around us is you know, competitive you don't know what your competitor is thinking and what decision he is uh, contemplating speed of decision making is the most important thing so never but if there is a trade off between accuracy of data and speed of decision making it is better to focus on speed of decision making but having said that it cannot be done by the seat of your pant it cannot be done on gut you have to have data you have to have analysis but draw what is actionable insight act fast if there are if there is a very large area of deployment consider doing pilots they always will give you good results because india is such a large country that you can always do experiments in a very controlled manner and one thing certainly if you look at the last and if i reflect only on the last 6 7 years uh, events like demonetization gst covid etc taught us that whatever forecast you may make whatever plans that you may make they are history as of yesterday so the agility of your response is far far more important than getting an accurate forecast and if you have the ability to have the right measures of whatever decision you are taking you can always do course correction uh, in good time i think sandeep has spoken all <laughs> what is required to be spoken i just add to what he is mentioning i think only in terms of i think dilemma is there uh, every day for all calls to be taken by the time it comes to a cfo it's gone through multiple rounds and you have to take a call in uh, very quickly you can't take much time and therefore i think i agree with sandeep that you must have a lot of data with you and and you use data and talk to more and more people take a conscious call than taking a call so i mean you can take slightly more time but take all information with you and take the call as most critical without that you're just going blind vimma i just want to add a couple of points here one is uh, quite frankly uh, and you know i moved from fmcg to real estate and uh, 
uh, I found real estate to be really tough and challenging, something I never wanted to do accounting. I ended up doing it there and it's fairly complicated, frankly. Now, I, however, if I go back and look at one of the aspects which one should get right is the org structure. Uh, what it means is that uh, internally within the finance function, within the organization and externally, can you reach out to experts or advisors to get your decision uh, making yeah. right? Okay, and therefore leverage the ecosystem fully and do not get into a scenario where any uh, investment proposal or whatever comes your way, uh, you are doing those five scenarios, 10 scenarios, but not concluding it. And or concluding it uh, being risk covered by saying that, you know, a lot of scenarios doesn't make sense to invest, let's not go ahead. Because uh, not taking risk is the biggest risk one, uh, one as a professional can take. Okay, and that is absolutely avoidable and therefore uh, get into data, uh, but conclude it, give, the, give your recommendation, taking ecosystem inputs and advices on board. And how much data is enough? I mean, I, I just want to, um, again, any questions or comments from the audience? So I want to ask that, you know, I, ha I wear an employee hat and I wear an entrepreneur hat. Now, the big difference between those two roles comes down to gut and judgment. As an entrepreneur, I have the freedom because ultimately, and I think it's hard to teach judgment, but I know that judgment plays a really big call. Now, do you keep getting data to justify your judgment or do you really dispense judgment and go with data? Because as an economist, I know what data can do and what it can say. So how... Till what point do you continue to get data to feel comfortable? And I want to ask the question that, and again, I mean, as truthful as you're willing to be, that do we continue to look for data to avoid being in trouble? Or do you really think we need that data for that call or that decision? I think there is no perfect answer. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think certainly in, in, in Pidlite, uh, all of us are thought at are taught and encouraged to think like entrepreneurs. Don't think that as an employee, you have to protect your backside, so have enough justification. Uh, I think that's not the way this organization works. Uh, it has always been amongst the most innovative organizations with a list as much of, we have as, I wouldn't call it a graveyard, but as many products that didn't do well as those mm -hmm. are successful in the market so and there is no penalty at least in our organization that if you fail you will get crucified as long as you did the fair amount of diligence mm -hmm. right so first of all obviously for every company there is strategy you've taken a certain call your decisions have to be aligned and supporting the strategy within that nobody can guarantee uh, outcome if they could then he won't be an employee right mm -hmm. if, if you could uh, guarantee uh, outcome so there is no no uh, penalty but yes you can't you can't fly a plane simply by the seat of your pants. You have to look at whatever data is there and at the end you still need a pilot, right? Nicely said. I think uh, without data, it's more a gut feel. I think you can't take a gut feel call always. So data is required to some extent. Beyond that, you take your judgment. Uh, just one point, which is uh, within the management team, are you usually acting as a passenger or are you at the driver's seat. Now it's very easy to say that I have this data, uh, this is not giving me result or this is like giving me yes and no both and therefore they say. Or the second way is to say that uh, here's the data but I have also done my research, field work, operations, interactions and based on this data and my own experience, this is the decision one should be taking. You know, and therefore go with that what works the best for the organization for the short term or maybe for the long term. Very nice. I mean, it's just been the most thoughtful, uh, thoughtful responses. And I think the show of hands at the beginning of this session gives me such immense hope for both businesses and humanity. Um, I've really had fun. I hope you've enjoyed the session. And please join me in thanking our panel for this absolutely outstanding. <laughs>